Directors values your input and feedback. Thank you to those of you that gave some feedback last time around. And a reminder, we'll have a couple opportunities today to help get your feedback on what you see. Process for tonight, we're going to divvy up into two groups. Uh, we're going to look at the inside of the facility for about 20 minutes, and that will be with one of our dynamic leaders, and then we'll switch, and then you'll get to see the outside. This school is built for permanent capacity with about 460 students. Pre-COVID, we were running up in about the mid-7s, about 750. We think our enrollment uh, right now as it sits, it's about 630, could be as high as 650. So one of the pieces you're going to hear and see, hopefully, are some of the successes we have with our facility, as well as some of the challenges uh, for housing kiddos. So when we come back here, we'll be here about 645, and then you're going to get to see some insights in terms of where we see the enrollment projections go for the system. Uh, over the next 10 years, we've gotten feedback from the developers surrounding our district. So you'll get to see your first glimpse about what does that look like in terms of number of anticipated homes and number of anticipated students. So we'll start to get your feedback about, so what do you think about what you see and what are some of your early conceptions about what your advice might be related to the data. So we'll have opportunities for two different pieces of feedback. One is on the tour, like we did last time, where you can either do that electronically or there'll be a form here when you get done. And then uh, another piece of opportunity for feedback after we look at enrollment projections about what are your initial conceptions about how the district should respond. So welcome to the home of the Mountaineers. Ah. Uh, you have a number. Uh, Miss Alicia, Miss Nita, can you wave your hands? Alicia is our principal, Miss Nita is our assistant principal, who all of our leaders had their first day back with staff today and bless their hearts, they're here to keep engaging just like you do after a long day of work, so thank you for taking that time out of your schedule. Miss Alicia, are you, are you taking the ones or twos? You got the ones. So if you have a number one on your entry point, will you follow Miss Alicia, please, for that first piece of the tour? And Miss Nita is back by our entry doors. If you're a two, can you find her? And we will get the tour underway. I hope you uh, see what we see, both through your tour of Oregon Primary School at Tarmigan Ridge Elementary, that we have some leaders doing some amazing things with our facilities and our schools and they're overcoming that adversity as best as they can. Uh, we would very much love and appreciate your feedback as a board of director team. Your eyes and what you see and what you notice is an excellent representation of what we think our community would notice and see and wonder. So that survey just helps us to get some insights in terms of what you notice about strengths of the facility, challenge of the facility, any things that you might wonder. All of that feedback will be reviewed by the Board of Directors as we wrap up this process in consideration of where do we go from here. What is our short-term, what is our medium-term vision for where we go with the facilities for the boarding school district. So we definitely would love your feedback. And again, you can have that completed before you go, but we'll take it in paper form. Or there's a survey link, a QR code. You can just use your smart device and take the paper with you and do that at your own convenience. Uh, as well as leaders, all of your feedback is very important. Uh, to help us decide where to go next. So we're going to walk you through a little bit of the feedback from the developers. The one thing I can promise you when we look at enrollment projections is whatever you see today will not be what happens. It's an imperfect science. We use a student generation rate of just under a half of a student per home. So that's our best guess as we try to model this out over the next two, uh, 10 years or so. And those numbers, what you're going to see, we have built to come in equitably across each grade level. So for instance, we're predicting 18 K-5 students. We put three in each grade band. The one thing I can also promise you, they will never come in equitably distributed. We'll have some years where certain grades pop and others don't. And uh, that's why it's just the imperfect science. But holistically, we think this will give you the best big picture representation of where this system is likely to go based on the data we have today. So Mike from our Granahan Architects, he's a principal architect with that company, is going to help walk you through some of the data we've collected and what that looks like. Okay. Everybody hear me? All right. Cool. So um, tonight, we want to review with you, uh, as Ed said, some of the, the findings that we're seeing from some of the projections for the developments, as well as um, the district has been experiencing about a 2% growth over its history. And so we're going to compare the two and see what that means for the facility age, capacity, and then what this enrollment growth might look like because we're getting the community 
pretty set for us the, the, the next 10 years. And beyond that, it's really hard to see. <laughs> and, and even right now, it's, it's a little bit of fuzzy science, but um, the big picture is what we're really interested in, in sharing with you tonight and get your impressions. That's what today's about, is just give us your impressions of what we think we're seeing in, in what's coming ahead. So we did this survey the first night um, we were together, and the things you all prioritized were the top three had to do with quantitative issues, like the growth of the future enrollment, and then facility improvements to existing schools. And it's quantitative in that um, there's so many years that a school lasts, and like the roof, you got to replace it, right? And so we want to look at the age, the facility conditions, and then a qualitative issue might be this educational mission, where how are we serving the variety of special needs? How are we giving students hands-on education, creative education, and all the things that we know make up a human being? Um, that's more of a qualitative issue in the planning of, of educational facilities. And there are many more qualitative issues that you ranked in there, and we're mindful of in this process. But uh, tonight we want to focus in on these quantitative issues. So if you're a quantitative person, this is your night. If you're more of a qualitative person, we'll be getting to those in the process. But um, this drives a lot of the dollars and the future planning and, and, and being able to house all the students. So the current conditions of facilities like we saw at OPS last time, that had facility conditions. This is relatively, this facility is in better shape, but the capacity is, a, is an issue where we heard that it was designed for 420 students, not enough restrooms around the place for the, for the students, or can't get all the students in here. Well, when it was designed for 420, that wasn't an issue. But we're pushing 700 down, and then on me on that. So that's where there's a mismatch. And then when we get into enrollment and looking at aging our facilities going forward, and where we're going to uh, situate the community for success as these students go into the community, um, we want to get your impressions about that. We're going to offer that tonight. So I have a feeling we're going to go a little bit faster and faster and faster as we go, and the numbers are going to get more and more <laughs> um, interesting to look at. So these are the things we want to focus on tonight. And um, we will have this available for you, but there, there's a history of facilities all the way back to the 1800s in this community, right? And the thing I wanted to point out with this, there's been developments all along, and then um, so there's a gymnasium added the, at the high school site that is still there. Um, and the second one was added in the 70s. And then in 68, you get into boarding primary. Um, and we put asterisks next to these because when a building built before 1993, turns 20 years old, then the state says, we'll help you improve it or replace it with state assistance. It turns out to be 15, 20 cents, 10 cents in some communities on the dollar, that kind of assistance. But after 93, they, they changed the rules. You gotta wait 30 years, right, before the state assistance. So, with um, PTR here, built in 2000, it's 2030. If that's a consideration in your timeline, thinking forward, you're going to get state assistance, like we said, 15 cents on the dollar. But that's, that's a fair amount of money when you, when you get into So that's a milestone we look at in our planning. Um, we ran some numbers in terms of how many students that the facility was designed to house. And then we, we look at the percentage of capacity that's in portables. And so already, you can see those portables in the end, outer areas of OPS, 37%. So their enrollment would be 117 students outside of the main building, out in portables, theoretically. I think at PTR, you've done a great job of keeping probably more, than, more of these students inside the main building in the way you schedule things. But um, capacity-wise, there's more capacity out in portables if you had to use them for general education and not those special programs that you've got out there. That's what it looks like when you get to full capacity. And more students out there in portables than inside. And so that's the distinguishing factor about this school, <laughs> among the others. And, and we already bought all the services. So uh, boarding middle school, gosh, they're right there with enrollment and building capacity. And it's a relatively new school, 2008. It's the newest, newest generation of schools in the community. Boarding high school, many generations of construction on that site. Um, and their uh, enrollment is beyond the capacity of the building, so that you see 12 portables on that site for that reason. So we were mindful of these things as we look at new developments coming online. Right? Already we're, we have schools beyond their current capacity, and we see more students coming. 
So, working with Terry and David here, um, we're getting some information from developers, and they're planning 3,300 homes in Tahali over the next 10 years. And then the Uplands area, which borders the Puyallup School District, from the hills there, 925 homes, and they're seeing the majority of their development in the earlier years. Um, Daybreak is up in the same area, earlier years, 535 homes. And then Sunrise, they're farther out. And they're looking at 400 homes, maybe 800 homes, so we will use the lower number for now. And you know, since it's farther out, their projections aren't as, 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 uh, as known, I guess, in terms of what they, they intend to do. So if you look at this, um, 5,000 homes projected over the next 10 years. And then, as I said, um, you can break it down, but it totals about a half a student per home. And so what we're seeing is when we look at this, and students coming in, and they matriculate up through their grades. And more come in each year, they matriculate up the grades. And so we looked at all the developments that way, we aggregated the information. And the blue bars show those developments and the years of development. As we said, some of them were sooner. Tahali's pretty much all the way straight through. But some years they plan to build 800 homes. Like next year, it's only 80. So there's that variability in there. And that may or may not play out, right? Depending on what the economy does or what their market looks like for them. But and if we just tonight, we want to give you an overview of what this, this could look like with these students coming into the, the, the community, into our schools, and then matriculating through graduation. And if we want to start to frame it in terms of when we go to the community and say, gosh, we've identified these needs. And this committee has said, wow, we release it yet, and we recommend we do X. And it recommend to the school board. The school board has some community input more, from the, from the broader than this group. And they make a decision to go out to the community for a bond vote. A lot of times it's set up in four-year increments. You come back to the community four years at a time. We can, that's variable, that's nothing set. But in terms of our planning, if we could say in 2022, for example, in 2026, 2030, um, we want to go to the community and as a just an example today. But if we have this bond vote in 2022, it takes three and a half years to build a school. And so it's ready in 2025, the fall of 2025, 26 school year. So you ought to be looking at those numbers a few years out in terms of what we're asking or thinking or contemplating about building now as we look forward to this. So here is the, the number of students that are projected to be generated from those developments, uh, to Holly being the biggest one, obviously. And then add those up, and there's 2,563 students coming to the community. And that their enrollment in 2019, it took a little dip, it's getting kind of fuzzy through the, the COVID, but we think that'll come back. So even to look back at 2019, there's 2,500 students. So this is a doubling. Uh, the number of students in boarding schools in the next 10 years. Just as a simple way to think about it. So we looked at 2% growth and then with these planned developments, what this does to the schools at the different levels. And this is where we get a little graphic going. So we think about things in terms of boarding primary school at 288 students on this graph with the number of students there. And then enrollment school years on the bottom. And they have 288 students permitting capacity. So many of the students are out here in the portable capacity. And so the total capacity on the site is the dotted line. Uh, PTR, 431 students, lots of students in portables. So they have a capacity that's pretty high if they use all the portables, right? You combine them together to the gray because third graders are at a beach school, second graders, kindergartners, right? So if we looked at the, the total capacity and tried to address that issue, that's this top line right here with all those portables. There's all these students here. It's 672 students capacity of portables. And here's the 2% enrollment growth. We're just showing the numbers. And they rise a little bit. But if we start to add these homes coming, that's what this looks like, right? So um, we're okay here. Here, but then in the 23 24 school year, um, we're just past our total capacity with all the portals. And then it goes from there. 
So it seems like you'd want to do something. <laughs> right? So one option that we looked at was um, to increase the permanent capacity at Oregon Primary. Like, just replace the whole school. Right? And so instead of 288 students' permanent capacity, or 456 total capacity, we would have 600 students. And that brings your combined permanent capacity up. And then if you keep those all those portables, well, now we start to get ahead of it for a year. So now we do something else. Now, a lot of these students by that point, as we saw, are coming from those developments, right? So a lot of the students that are in these numbers, they're not this 2% growth. This is the difference between these are students coming from developments into the elementary schools. So here's another thing we can do. Let's say we do the Orient Primary School, increase it, you know, replace it with a bigger building. That got us somewhere. And then if you were to do a school up in the developments and talk to the developers and get some land, as David and Terry are helping the district with, um, if you keep all the portables, then we're way ahead for about four or five years. Okay? <laughs> and so then we want to get another school. And that gets us way ahead with our permanent capacity. Um, and then we're starting to make chunks. And so it's really about how we use and build new capacity in the community and then um, stay out of it with portables. And so it seems like in the near term, you might want to consider replacing Orting Primary because it's old and it's not great. And you could get some wonderful new space. And that could have the effect of helping here as well, right, with that additional capacity. And so um, up in the developments, whether it's the holiday or the top lands, we can we keep thinking about that. But so those are options that we, we offer for you. And so you can see these jumps happen like this during those years when we've asked the community, they said, yes, let's build it, and they open, right? So the ask was here, and the opening is there, three, four years later. The middle school, right now, things are good. They're just under their permanent capacity, and then we're, if the 2% the growth happened, um, some of the, the classes behind middle school are, are smaller than the current middle schools. I think that's why you're not seeing the line go up very much here. It stays kind of flat. But with the new housing, that's what happens. And so if you were concentrating on the elementary schools up front in the early years, you might not want to ask the community for a middle school and getting new capacity to the later years. And so we would look at maybe moving some portables from somewhere in the district where you build new capacity and move some portables over to um, Corey Middle. So um, we have some ideas about how to, where to site a middle school and how to, how to create that capacity, but we're looking at 750 students in school as an example. So um, getting to the high school now. Here we got a permanent capacity, we got 12 portables taking care of this, and things are okay until we start to see students coming in from the developments. This looks familiar now, doesn't it? Options. Uh, one option might be to build 400 student new capacity on my school site. Just a new building. Maybe you have to keep the portables because we're, we're chasing this stuff. So even if you retained the portables, you caught up to it and then it gets ahead of you. So if we add this additional capacity on the high school site and keep the, the other permanent capacity you've got and keep the portables, there you are. And maybe it's later on we talk about um, a 1500 student high school or something like that. And what have we done with all this development on the high school site? Right now the high school, like PTR, it has a performing arts center, it has a commons, it has a library, it has a lot of facilities that were right for an eight or 900 student school. Maybe that could be 750 and her student middle school if we convert it when we build a new high school. So that's an option we can consider. And to stay ahead of that growth, we might need to move some of the portables and keep them up there with this new high school until we can expand it again. And we're looking at maybe an 1800 student high school out there in the future um, over the next 10, 12 years. So again, it's when we ask for which projects to do these things. So this was converting the high school to middle school and you get, set, you get this capacity for the middle school. And then this new high school might be on a new site. That's one way we're thinking about it. 
So uh, another option would be to build this 1200 student high school, keep the portables, and then just keep adding on to that. But that doesn't really address then what you do with the old high school on the site. So we're trying to think of those two things in tandem and think of our solutions as being community-minded and holistic. And those schools in the valley, and those schools up in, in the new developments. So here's some findings and some observations. And what we want to do after this is take your questions. But also we've got these uh, presentation boards here where we take all of these proposed solutions and we want your take. You know, what would you do first? What would you do second? What would you do third? And if we get a sense from everybody about where you see the priorities and what you, we're showing you the needs as projected by the developments that the developers are talking about doing and the impact it has on your schools, primarily for growth, and trying to think of creative ways to replace old buildings and get this new capacity in the right places in all the communities, right? So maybe elementary want to be closer to those family living homes, and that middle school and high school stays in this area and serves the whole district. So we're seeing projected development. We have a high proportion of students in portables, and it's going to get higher. Um, Forty priority is in bad enough condition to replace. Um, others have deficiencies that might be improved with renovation or addition, like getting some security around the perimeter of this site would be a great first step, right? And it's not a big capital investment. So we would think about things like that. Already the roof is getting replaced. That's great. Um, Fording High School has core facilities that are hard to expand to double the enrollment. It's going to be hard to be a big commit to double the size of enrollment at that site. Um, probably need some new sites. So where does that make sense? Where is their property available? That's being looked into, but there's no answers to that yet. And that we may locate some new schools in the plan development. And let's not forget that administration, food service, maintenance, transportation, they serve every school very well <laughs> right now, people are saying. So you've got a lot of kudos to this. But we saw in our last meeting the condition that those people who serve all the schools, all the families, and all the staff um, in the community, um, we need to find the right time to fix that, to fit that into the mix. So, what questions do you have? What observations do you have? Um, we've got what we just laid out. At every age level, um, some options. And what Ben's going to turn over here is, is a board where we're going to use some, some sticky dots. And uh, the green is your highest priority. Yellow would be your second priority. If you go and do three things right away, what would they be? And then orange is your third priority. Okay? But do you have questions about it? I mean, what are your impressions? Maybe you take five minutes with that on your impressions of what we just showed you. It's like drinking from a fire, I'm not sure. But uh, okay. I gotta turn this on. I'll just talk loud. Um, how much influence do we have when we're talking about building new facilities? Okay. Uh, how much influence do we have when we're talking about building new facilities, especially if we're doing it uh, locally within Oregon proper, on trying to expand the highway out here? More students, more traffic. Is there any option to try to get someone to turn it in from a two lane to a four lane? With regard to DOE, no, not very much influence with the Department of Transportation. Uh, we do know our city partners have had conversations, and where we sit presently on the priority list is not at the top of that list. So we will be growing and wrestling with uh, increased congestion in the near term. I do believe the city as a partnership is going to be continuing to pursue that, and the district through any type of growth has to go through that traffic mitigation analysis process where we'll be looking at things holistically. So any one site, we're going to look through that 10-year lens as part of our building to make sure that we're thinking through as thoughtful as we can about how we construct and route traffic in a way that doesn't add to the issue. So as far as the uh, halo goes, um, there's a lot of community that's already been built up there, and those kids are going to Bonnie Lake High School, I believe. Um, with the numbers that you 
projected for us was that new development that has not been built up there yet. Boundary adjustments are certainly part of what we can consider, and there's some pros and cons to that. So, generally, uh, we do have a conversation actually happening right now with Sumner Monty Lake School District out of potential boundary adjustment into Holly. Alliance could build a request, so that's up for consideration. Uh, the reasons why you would or wouldn't are going to come down to your voter capacity and ability to construct. And also, you have to consider your assessed valuation, because with those developments come what we would believe is potential yes voters largely based on the clientele and assessed valuation. So right now the way wording sits, we're about $2.1 billion worth of assessed valuation, which is enough bonding capacity for about $100 million. When you think about long term, you could price wording's ability out of the ability to redo even existing facilities if we don't have some mechanism to grow. We don't have a large commercial tax base, so with that growth gives us also the ability to think about things that we can do and what we see uh, is really that the near-term assessed valuation growth that we're going to see over the next five or six years does give us the capacity to build and construct and see out in front if that's the direction we decide to go. So we don't see a, a scenario where there's just doom and gloom and no way to do it. The AV actually grows faster than the enrollment in the near term. So we think there's capacity, but not to do everything on the list. We're going to have to hear, and that's where your feedback is important. We have to be intentional. So not only are, are these funding say bond programs, but these new homes are helping fund operations and maintenance and special programs in the district that the levies fund. So like I said, there's just pros and cons. No. So the state has a very prepared formula for how to decide how much money to give to this community. Right? It's based on the dollars of the square foot, which have traditionally not followed the market. It's based on square feet per student, which generally doesn't match the educational philosophy of most communities, like the shared space we saw there, or providing good spaces for special services. So they have a factor. And then um, there was one more factor. Oh, yes, yeah, so there's, uh, there's a range of 20% to 80%. It goes to a community that's property rich. You can down to the 20% range. So you take those other two things, and we'll give you 20% of that. So um, we don't rely on state funding assistance for our strategy, but it's there. And it's really to help. But in terms of how you build your school, that's what you need to decide. You referenced a great question. That's where your feedback is so important because it has to do with what is our standard of care? What is our ideal school size? Is it five or 600 students? Is it a thousand students? What do we think about that class size ratio? Because as you've even seen with your tour today, we can desire close up our lower class size, but if we don't have places to put them, it just becomes an impossibility. Uh, things like categorical programs, intervention, specialist time, all those pieces constitute our standard of care, and your feedback about what that looks like helps to shape the board's vision around how we lean into a bond campaign, and that's why your voice and feedback is so important to this process to help us think through what is really resonating with this stakeholder group in a way that we can launch whatever that bond campaign might look like. I got it. Um, so just a question.
question. So it sounds like we have room to build another middle, elementary school, but that's probably not the best location to build another elementary school. Is there an opportunity to gain revenue by selling land in Ording to be able to fund these other Ording schools? Uh, absolutely. We have uh, land, and land is always a bargaining tool with regard to exchange potentially with other developers. They're always looking for places they can build residential. We have the 22 acres out on Orville Road or other land that the board could consider selling or trading could be a viable option. So as we think through that longer term plan, traffic, mitigation, what that standard of care, standard of service looks like, all factors that shape what that ultimate plan could look like. Some building we believe is possible. That's before this process is done. We should have some feasibility information where we can share with you about the, the myth of the reality of what's happening out of Moorville. We believe at this point the zoning may change in the near term by 2025. So part of our conversations is we get your input to talk to developers and look where potential building sites might be. That's part of that factor equation uh, that the board would consider, which is do we hold thinking it could be buildable in a few years? Do we trade and uh, the opportunity, for instance, for a high school site, if that's some of the feedback, a 40 acre piece somewhere else. So uh, we think that is buildable for some capacity things right now, not presently a full school. Uh, however, it could be at some point in the near term, the next few years is what we think today. But we'll have that full land review for you, as much information as we can provide. And right now, uh, we're in initial conversations for two parcels, a 15 and a 25 acre parcel in the Del Holly neighborhood and a little over a 10 acre parcel in the Uplands. So, uh, and there's also additional conversations we're having and some of those with our city partners as well about our other options within city limits. So our tip based on your feedback is to be ready in some capacity to move forward uh, if your feedback and board of directors say go. How much land do we need to actually build a school? Good question. How much land to build a school? If you're just using general OSPI, Office Superintendent of Public Instruction, standard of care, they would say somewhere in the neighborhood of about uh, 10 to 15 acres for an elementary, 15 to 25 for a middle school, and up to 40 for a high school. Great for us if we can find it. In the city of Seattle, they're building elementary schools on two, three, four acres. So part of your standard of care, and are you going up or going out uh, based on those factors, your field space, those kind of things, all that drive, but uh, we would want to, in our negotiations, have at least 15 acres for an elementary site, ideally when we're talking about developers. But the reality is, if you had 10, you could still build a school at 10 acres. Um, I'm just thinking, oh, sorry. Yep. I'm gonna go to Bonnie first, because I'm more scared of her than I am of you. <laughs> comment about that Lions Club field that we have, the 22 acres. We couldn't build there because we did not have an evacuation plan that they would approve by the county. So they limited us to a 200 student school and 200 students was not enough for our purposes. Thank you, ma'am. I, I just, I guess my new learning tonight, and I guess the follow-up question on that was, so, so I guess, you know, you hear the conversation, ultimately the brass tax conversation is, the development's coming. Do we stay small and in the valley or go up on the hills, right? And I don't think it's, I don't think it's as easy as a simple, what Ned said is it's not that simple. So I think my new learning, and I just want to check this for understanding and then ask a question. What I heard you say is if we, if, the, if we stayed small and stayed in the valley, that our assessed value and our capacity to go out and re renovate the current existing buildings would not in the future be there. So you look at OPS Elementary, I think my aha about that is, it's one argument to say let's just stay small, stay in the valley, but the tax base in the valley is not gonna have the money to renovate these buildings as they grow older and older and older and as 
the needs of our kids get more complex with what we're asking them to do in the building. So I don't, I, that was a new learning for me tonight. I don't think it's as simple as just the argument of let's stay small versus let's expand. And my question on that would be that that maximum assessed value, if we stay in the value, that fluctuates simply based on my understanding is home values. We don't have any commercial tax base. Is that correct? Yeah, Marcy is a mathematical ninja, Marcy Bennett, and kind of what we see is in the last maybe nine years or so, our assessed valuation has been growing about 12% per year. That's not the norm. If you go back to the historical average, it's about 4 to 5%. If we go look at a 20-year projection, the price of construction is escalating generally faster than assessed valuation. So where we would have said 6 to 8% escalation, we're looking at 12% or more based on the cost of commodities and goods. So it could, if we don't grow, to your point, we may have our cost for just replacing what exists grow faster than what our assessed valuation does without some type of additional revenue in assessed valuation. I mean, it's, it's complex in math, but that's what uh, we have seen. And you will see, we'll have our bond agent here a couple meetings from now. We'll have our projections on assessed valuation. You will all get to see that data, and he'll share different strategies and what exists in the market and things like that. So that will be definitely part of something you will see. Okay, we're ready to get some feedback. Yeah, are there any questions about some of the options that we put out there for you that are on the board? What's in these? So, I, I just I sent from the first moment when you said, are there any questions we're all we're looking at these options? Are, so when this committee provides feedback with our sticky dots, is that the recommendation this group is going to make to the board, or is this just the starting conversation? This is starting. So, this is starting. This feedback will help the architect team draft some scenarios and help us to tell the story. If we were to try to bring those scenarios to fruition, we could look at through the cost perspective to see what would be feasible as we bring that bonding information back. So it's helping to get see where the pulse is today so we can put some hypothetical scenarios together and bring it back to this committee so they can see what that would look like, not only from a planning but a cost perspective as well. Which 
interest for us is that 5% of assessed valuation is about $100 million capacity today. And you will see over the next 10 years when we show that assessed valuation will over triple. So it gives some great leeway. I don't disagree with money either. Ready for dots? I really want that process to it.
a wonderful conversation Saturday. We'd like to see if we can pull it back together in a minute or so. as well as the live stream will be available on the website shortly. 
on behalf of the board of directors, and we have three with us tonight, Director Thibodeau, Director Kinsler, and Director Madigan. They really appreciate your time, as to the district. This is instrumentally valuable to help us move forward, and your feedback is critically important. If you haven't had a chance to provide some survey feedback, please take that with you, do the electronic piece, or fill it out before you go. And we really appreciate your time, take it away from loved ones, families, work, things like that, to help us look to the future in the Oregon School District. Thank you very much, have a wonderful night.